heard. There we go. <laughs> um, so we are recording so that we have a playback for those that couldn't be here tonight with us. And um, for privacy, just if you don't want to have your video enabled, um, feel free to disable it, but we'd love to see your, your smiling faces. Um, we are going to be posting information and links that hopefully will work in the chat. And if you have any questions, feel free to privately chat with myself or Elena. We'll keep on top of those things. And if you have any questions put them for our um, speakers tonight, feel free to put that in the chat as well. All right, critical links. Um, everybody should have their email from today, which has this wakelet, which has an un a very long, long list of resources that you can use for tonight and things that we have talked about. Um, so feel free to open that. That should have at least the post survey should work. But again, I need to get the sign in to work. Um, so you can refer back to that. And if there's anything there that we may have missed, let me know and we can add it to the Wakelet link. So what is our fun for tonight? Well, we've got almost two hours together. Um, we're gonna knock out this part one right here and um, then we'll float into hearing from one of our Stroud Center scientists in, in the ecosystem science department or lab, Dr. Mark Papak, um, and enlightening us on what's going on in the freshwater world relating to climate change and any impacts that we might specifically see with those types of systems. We'll have a small break where you can ask Mark more questions because I'm sure um, you'll really, really love his presentation. A little stretch break built in. And then followed by a great presentation with Shane Morgan, where we're going to dive deep into a local watershed here to Stroud um, and in the Delaware River Basin called White Clay Creek. And then we'll um, have Elena and myself a little bit share some of the resources on the wakelet just to pinpoint some of the really ones that we just thought were really unique or su very supportive for you. And um, we'll have you fill out a survey too and share with you some really cool updates upcoming events that you can get engaged in the White Clay Watershed and with the Stroud Water Research Center, and then any last thoughts that we might have. Um, but tonight we're going to be talking about, um, not directly about this thing called a MIWI, which is Meaningful Watershed Educational Experience um, that was really begun um, with NOAA and the Chesapeake Bay Foundation. I'm sure many of you are what are called MIWI ambassadors and we've put a link in the wakelet to learn more about this funny thing called a MIWI. <laughs> um, but there are four steps and this is how to make an experience with your students, whether you're a formal or informal educator, more meaningful and it includes some type of action project. And tonight we're gonna be not um, going through all phases of this MIWI, um, but going over what is the, the issue and going through some of those um, relating to freshwater systems. So Mark, we'll really be going over that as well as Shane. And then some of the um, ideas that come out of this, hopefully with you doing a little bit of synthesis and conclusions. The outdoor field experiences are gonna be um, something that hopefully you can brainstorm tonight as we go along and as well as stewardship and civic action, which actually Shane will be covering a lot of um, those options as well. But if you haven't heard of a MIWI, this is a really great structure to bring into your life. There's a free online course called MIWI 101. And the link again is in the, the wakelet if you wanna explore what those are all about. All right, so um, let me go into this. You know, why are we here? Um, as many of you know, this is a really a good time to bring in climate change science literacy. And um, I'm gonna pop up here when I can juggle the screens probably after Mark's talk, but um, to know how many of you do teach about climate change and how comfortable are you teaching about it and what resources you have available. So I wanna do a poll here in a little bit, but um, you know, it's really a time to empower students for positive change, and that brings back that MIWI framework to help you with that. But we know that's not always easy. And some states right now do not even have climate change explicitly in their standards. Pennsylvania is an example of this, but um, we have new environmental standards coming in the next few years that are going to hopefully bring this in um, kind of lightly. <laughs> Um, but teachers are not always knowledgeable in the latest climate change science also and where to get the most credible science data. 
Um, earlier this year, I was in a session at the Association for Science Teacher Education, actually in South Carolina. And there were a panel of science education professors who mentioned many of these challenges and we're doing research with teachers. And there are a lot of things that are lacking and um, a lot of teachers aren't com as comfortable teaching about this topic that we're gonna be brushing along tonight. But here are some, um, you know, opinions from the National Center for Science Education. I just want you to take a minute to read um, some of these quotes here. Um, Michael Mann saying the climate crisis is the defining challenge of our time. I bet many of you would agree with that. <laughs> Jacqueline Gill, they already know climate change is a problem, but we need to also make sure they know that there are solutions we all can be a part of. And that's where, you know, the hope and there is, you know, climate um, anxiety going on. There is a group of actually climate um, psychologists that offer free resources to people going through climate change, um, climate anxiety. So it is a real issue emotionally um, and, and mentally. And then Benjamin Santer, you know, they have to know how and why the Earth's climate is changing, what those changes mean for their own future and what they can do to prevent bad outcomes for our climate system. So we won't go into all the ins and outs of climate change specifics tonight, but here are the identified major hurdles for most science educators when it comes to teaching about climate change. And um, you can bring these into your thoughts tonight as we go along. You know, often terms get confused. And so this is a huge list here, but um, again, you can review some of this and we're gonna give you resources that actually go into each of these a little bit deeper so that you will be able to be proficient in understanding the differences in these terms. But the differences between climate and weather, you know, climate is a long-term regional or global, usually average of things like temperature and humidity and precipitation patterns over seasons or years, um, but weather refers to atmospheric conditions that happen over the short term, such as like rain and clouds and snow and storms. So, you know, weather is usually short term and localized. Climate change, um, which, you know, versus, or not versus, but climate change and global warming. Global warming is a type of climate change, but climate change encompasses a lot of different shifts on the planets, like um, global warming and cooling, sea level rise, glacier loss, increasing severity and frequency of storms and change in, you know, plant blooming periods. So um, there's a lot there when it comes to talking about climate change versus the global warming, you know, and there are so many other topics here too that we're going to talk about tonight about climate resiliency and what that, you know, means relating to freshwater systems. But it's also good to know that you should look at the data, um, be very critical of it, um, look for good sources, which we have provided for you tonight. Um, examine how communities can prepare for these changes is always a good topic with students and looking at not only global impacts, but local, which is what we're gonna bring in tonight when we talk about um, a beautiful river called White Clay Creek. So, um, so here we are tonight discussing the impacts on freshwater systems in the light of what are called wild and scenic river systems. And Shane's gonna go into this um, a lot more, but a lot of these rivers and um, were established and called this by a national wild and scenic river system, um, actually public law that was enacted in 1968. And you can find out a lot about these on your website, but. You know, these rivers are classified as wild, scenic, or recreational, and there's, as of 2019, um, this national system protects over 13,000 miles of 226 rivers and 41 states. Let me bring up a little bit of map here, Pennsylvania. So we're going to be honing in on this little watershed right here, which is actually nationally, not only a national wild scenic river, but Shane will talk about it, an entire watershed, which is a very rare designation to have and so special for us. And so here's a little picture of this beautiful creek that we'll be engaging with later tonight. All right, on to the fun stuff, enough about me. <laughs> Mark, are you here? <laughs> Let's see if I am. Awesome, I'm gonna stop sharing and welcome 
Mark Pipak, um, who is an amazing scientist here with the Stradwater. Oh. Now you've been with us <laughs> what, for three, you last so. everything. <laughs> so Mark, if you want to introduce yourself a little bit, then you can take it away for us. Thank you so much. Sure. And people share screen capabilities. So let me know. If I was just checking that out in case okay. that I don't have the right permission. <laughs> How about that? Yeah, perfect. Thank you. Good. Yeah. So I'm an assistant research scientist here. I joined the Stroud Center in 2018. I consider myself an ecosystem ecologist. Basically means that everything I do, it's got to do with big picture and not too much about detail. Um, I'm originally from Spain, although I've been in the US for, I don't know, 10 years or so. so that's starting to not be a thing anymore. Um, other than that, I uh, get take any opportunity I get to collaborate with the educators. It's a lot of fun. And I, I hope I can give you guys some good information that can help you in your jobs, which as a father of three kids, I put you in a high stand. <laughs> and they do know about climate change. That's right. All right, is this thing moving? Perfect. Thank you. Yeah, good. Yeah. So it's funny when I when you were talking and making a difference between global warming and, and, and climate change. I also wanted to start by acknowledging that most of what I'll what I'll be showing you today and talking about, I, I don't think it's just climate change. It's more of global change. That would be a better definition. And quite frankly, when you talk about climate change and streams and rivers, it's just it's just very difficult to just talk about the climate because there are so many interactions and we just haven't changed the climate, right? This term of global change, it's a little bit more fair in the sense that we have urbanized fair amounts of land. We are intensively uh, uh, cultivating crops that have serious effects for all the aquatic ecosystems. We're mining, we're building dams, all these together, it, you know, it didn't just change the climate. We did all this and on top of that, we have the climate and the global warming and all these, um, uh, elements that all together really affect streams. And, and there's a reason I, I think why um, you can say that streams are particularly affected or where it's quite easy or noticeable to find the effects of climate change and global change in streams. And in, in plain words, it's because streams are at the end of the line, so to speak. You know, they, they really drain the landscape. You know, sometimes we use the analogy it's more of a kidney system that just rains all the landscape. And if you think about everything in the water that ends up in the stream, it means that the soil, the forest, top of the mountains, they didn't use it. So it's sort of collecting all these leftovers. And therefore, if you think on climate change effects on stream, probably best not to go and start looking in the water, but go in the entire watershed. That's where you need to look. Everything that happens in the watershed, how climate change will affect the forests, the prairies, the, the crops, the snow, all that will translate into what happens in, in the stream in terms of water quantity and water quality. And I'll try to give you some, some examples. But these are the kind of the two things I wanted to, to highlight at the beginning. Then we can start talking about the climate change impacts in, in, on stream ecosystems. And Tara asked me to, to do these as close as possible to White Clay Creek. And I tried, but there are also some, I think, very cool, good examples, not cool, but uh, good examples that uh, should be, I, I would like to share with you. And, and I like this figure a lot, uh, honestly. It kind of makes a nice job at showing a great variety of climate change impacts on stream ecosystems from, from small creeks in the mountains to big rivers. And the first one I wanted to talk about is the snowpack issue or, or snow melt, I should say. I think it's probably been over the last, two decades, we, we started to have some very, very convincing data that shows that, especially in the West and the Northeast as well, these rivers that they have a pretty simple hydrology. They're, you know, they're, it's pretty much low flow until the spring, the snow melt generates this big flood, one flood, one big flood a year, you know, and all the organisms are well adapted to that. And data comes in and shows that not only we have less snow, that that's that's more known around the society, but the snow smelts much faster or sooner. 
And right now we already have on average about 10 days, all these triangles show about an average about 10 days, five to 10 days, and many of them 10 days earlier than usual. And that doesn't seem a big deal to us for our time frame. But if, if you think, try to put yourself in an insect mind that you have about a month to develop you know, your, your entire life stage and become an adult. And here suddenly you've changed 30% of that time frame and you, you show up at a very different time than we are supposed to because 10 days make, make a difference in that time frame. That's, I think already, it's one example of climate change in streams that it, it's been, there's a lot of literature, at least in peer reviewed scientific literature and the evidence is, it's pretty overwhelming. Another one that I like to point out is the fact that we still, you know, we're still building dams and you know, probably bias for where we live you know, we don't think of this as an issue right here, but if you think about fighting climate change, what's the best possible thing you could do or a good start would be to, you know, stop relying so much on fossil fuels. You know, an easy and fair solution, and frankly, the one that we can, know we can do it is to build more hydropower and, and, and try to get our energy, energy from the water. And, and that is fine, but you also know probably that that has tremendous negative consequences for pretty much everybody who lives in stream from uh, small things to fish and also to the, to the hydrology. And we are not particularly on the top, actually. We are not building many dams anymore. Um, but if you look at Asia and South America, there's still a lot of dams being built, a lot being uh, projected in, in beautiful places like the Mekong River, which is a spectacular river in, in Asia. And it's about to be dam as well. So, it's kind of a situation where in order to do better in terms of our reliance on fossil fuels, we, we're you know, damming rivers that we know it's not, not gonna be helpful for them. But in order to you know, stay closer to our area, I think of all these um, options here, you know, groundwater, habitat loss, forest fires, you know, if you were in California, probably have chosen that one. The one I really wanna talk about today is this extreme weather. It has very close ties to how agriculture affects the streams, but mostly these extreme weather, extreme flooding or extreme rainfall events. I'll probably use these words all around, but what's going on with the climate change altering how frequent and how strong, how intense in magnitude these extreme rainfall or weather events have become. I should probably, I, I think it's fair to say that it's one of the strongest, perhaps the strongest, but certainly the most pervasive climate change impact on stream is these changes in the flow regime. And by flow regime, I mean, you know, usually we can, we can say, well, tell me where that stream or where that river is in terms of the geography. And I should have an idea of what, how much water should I find throughout the year, right? We know like, like before I was mentioning the case for spring melt rivers or others that are in rainfall, uh, uh, dominated or desert streams that only flush every now and then. We know that we call it the flow regime and these climate change effects are really making a hint on changing that paradigm. And you can imagine that everybody who lives in the river finds that pretty uh, overwhelming in the sense that you have adapted and evolved to a certain flow regime and now it's being changed. So it really has effects on, on the productivity of the ecosystems and how much plants and algae can do photosynthesis on the nutrient cycling, and most importantly, on the species that live in there. And this, in, in 2018, I think we got, got a beautiful picture of, of what's going on because it's really, a, it's really an extreme situation. It's not just happening in the same manner everywhere. In fact, where we are, we are getting the extreme wet part of the spectrum and some places in the Southwest and Northwest, they're coming drier, right? And well, you could mention that this was uh, it's a ranking period of, uh, I believe in Chester County, we had the second wettest year in record in 2018. And you know, it's one year. You could say, well, not all regions are being impacted equally, but you know, maybe 2018 was just a bad one. And in reality, we're seeing that this seems to be uh, a little bit more compelling in the sense that this is showing for the last 70 years. And now we look at, well, let's take a look at how much of this precipitation falls in one of these, in these heavy events. You know, we call this the 1%, the 1% of the highest or the strongest rainfall, um, how much of that have increased? And we see again, this pattern that in the West, 
So the percent increase is very low in the amount of precipitation that falls in very heavy events. Think of you know, a tropical storm kind of stuff. And here we are on the top, you know, the 71%, a 70% increase in the amount of precipitation of, you know, that falls with, within heavy events. So it's not just really about, oh, tell me how much water you got this year. It's about how you got that water. Did you get it you know, in five rain events that were kind of smooth and you get, you know, the land has time to soak the water or they just fall in one event that totally uh, collapse the whole land and then we have these large floods. And this, is, this seems to be also uh, happening. And, and I, I think the evidence starts to be at a point where it just started to say that this could just be random. And uh, unfortunately, we've got familiar with it, just, you know, with Ida was the last one, and uh, everybody who's in the area remembers that very well, especially those who live in the Brandywine um, watershed, which was probably one of the, the most impacted ones. And Unfortunately, too, the USGS maintains a, a, a stream flow station in Chatsworth, right when where the Route One crosses Brandywine Creek. It's one of the oldest that we have. We have a record from 1912 to date. And if you plot the maximum flow that we've seen in that uh, spot every year, you know you see these big storms every now and then. This is all at one the biggest storm of the year. But there are some years that you really get a big, big storm. It happens every now and then until lately, since the 2000s. They really seem to be picking up and happening more frequently. And we're not at the point that you can say, well, that's you know for sure statistically significant, or, or I definitely see a pattern. But you look at this plot and you surely start, you know, to, brings you some concern that it does look like we are getting more of these extreme events seem to be happening more often. And in the case of Ida, for instance, was, was the highest ever on record. How about White Clay Creek? So, well, here, this is right outside my office. So this is, uh, it's, I should say the East Branch of the East Branch of White Clay Creek. It's not the entire watershed. And we don't have a record that goes back to 1912, but we have one that goes back to 1970, 1968, to be more accurate. And well, here, the, the news are a little better. You know, we don't really see this pattern. And you know, just to be a little bit optimistic, I think, you don't really know uh, how much you can trust that this pattern is not here because of climate change, or perhaps we would like to think that because this watershed, this subwatershed, has really received a lot of attention, mostly from the from the Stroud Center and, and our collaborators. And there's been a lot of riparian reforestation and installation of these level leaf spreaders that collect water uh, runoff from the fields, uh, floodplain wetlands. We don't remove large wood in the channel, which is something simple but effective. A lot of best management practices, practices in the land. All these helps decrease flood. And again, not really saying that there's a cause and effect, but I think what I wanted to say here is, is there are things we can do to mitigate climate change when it comes to reducing or you know, mitigating these extreme flood events and how they affect us, but also the rivers. And you know, sometimes, you got to rely on these uh, little examples to show that if we do things, we can. That's one of the climate change effects that we can really try to mitigate, and probably not, you know, eliminate, but at least reduce it as much as as we can. And why do I insist so much? Or why? What is it? And what's the problem with changing the flow regime? Well, the flow regime is really, you know, we we call it one of the most essential variables or or controls that you can think of. Is really this timing and the magnitude of the flood event of the flow. It, it just shapes the life and the, the life history of everybody who lives in there. And you know, to say some examples, like if you think of uh, think about the leaf fall in in, in in October and all those um, leaf materials are really uh, you know many many organisms rely on that as a food source. And we start having an increased frequency of floods that flush all that away. Well, suddenly there's going to be a large amount of organisms that are really in a short supply of food resources. And the same, for instance, in the case of algae, but you know, not they, they do get a little bit of bad press, but there's a whole lot of uh, organisms. Think of the snails, for instance, the snails are the, the classic the paradigm example of grazers. They rely on algae, and algae really grows well 
about three weeks or so, this period, we're about to get into it. When things are warm enough, but there are no leaves in the trees, there's plenty of light, that's when algae thrives. And these uh, consumers really get a lot of energy from the algae during this these time period. If, again, if we have an unexpected you know, high floods, so extreme events during that time that scour all that, somebody will be suffering the consequences. And, and, and the best example is probably insects uh, and their emergence, which is very strongly tied. No matter where they live, they, they know the flow regime. They, they understand, they have this synchrony and the evolution that brought them to the timing of temperature and flow and pressure. When do they need to come out? Good conditions to find what they need to eat to grow, to mate with the X back. We're, we're really messing here. I mean, we, you were trying to tell me, how can I disrupt everybody in green? Changing the flow regime would be the way to do it. And that's why it's important to try to fight that as much as we can, not only for us and, us, you know, and, and the damage that that produces to our ourselves, but also to everybody who lives in there. Uh, this going on and going on and going on has, has effects that will last for very long. You know, there, there, there are, and there's already evidence of it and, and more that will happen on how these species shift geographically. Uh, think about the first example of snow being melted before. Places where some insects and fish could not live there now are not so much snow melt driven anymore. So some species will be able to move farther north. Some others will be able to move further down if, if it becomes drier. And this is not, you know, not, not a problem on its own. It's, it's happened all the time in Earth. But we do are going to have, you know, we're going to have losers and we're going to have winners. And the problem of altering the abundance of some species and not others usually have the problem that you know, the winners, they were already there and now they are more abundant. The losers, if they disappear, well, there's not much you can do. You don't, you don't get them back. It's not like once they're done, they could recover later on. When a species is done, it's done. So th that is the risk when you think of the climate change effects on, on communities and species in particular is that there are gonna be some, some effects that we're just never gonna recover from. And for instance, uh, an example that I particularly like is the one about fish populations. I, I think that speaks well of our conditions and, and how global warming has been affected. Fish habitats in, in the US um, streams and rivers this is a landmark study and it's from 2003. So the situation might even be worse. It's pretty striking that we have lost as much as, uh, of habitat, of cold water habitat, as much as we've gained warm water. What essentially that means is that we are losing trout habitat and generating trout for you know, things like common carp, which usually we don't like that much, there's nothing wrong with them, but you know, again, some, some winners, some losers. And the problem is that if, what we lose, we will just never recover. Well, these guys were here before, they're just now finding good habitat that they were not able to reach in, in, in previous uh, conditions. But, um, beyond, you know, species and, and all that community effects, another very important part of what happens when we increase this frequency of, of ex extreme events, these floodings, these, these high uh, precipitation events. Well, again, if you think of the streams being the end of the line, it means that we're doing more, we're doing more flushing, we're doing more rinsing, we are uh, promoting the movement of sediments, pollutants, nutrients from the watershed, to the, to the stream. And, you know, sometimes I use the analogy that if, if, if the watershed is our driveway and then it rains and gets all that out of the driveway down to the road, you know, the driveway was dirty before the rain came. And our watersheds, some of them are, are quite dirty. So increasing the splashing, all it's gonna do is just to get all that into the streams more and more. And that obviously will have no good consequences for anybody. I think one of the situations where that's more clear is with agricultural runoff. You know, I would like to point out two things in here. First is how does this nitrogen and phosphorus, which we usually associate with uh, cultivated crops, how do they end up in streams and rivers? And how is this climate change and extreme events affecting that nutrient delivery? First, let me point out that you know, sometimes I'm not particularly keen to the term nitrogen or, or nutrient pollution or nitrogen or phosphorus pollution. Those, those two elements are natural nutrients that have always been here and in the right dose, 
we need them as everybody else to build biomass. The problem is with the, all these new arrows, all these new uh, flushing fluxes that we have added, wastewater runoff from urban settings, you know, soil moving out of um, agricultural lands, leakage into the groundwater. This is all us, but you know, all these two elements, all we've done is put more of nitrogen and more of phosphorus in a system that was not supposed to have so much, but uh, they are not pollutants in, in themselves. So in the right dose, they're at, the problem is we have all this sitting in here. And by increasing the amount of rinsing of the landscape, increasing the amount of extreme events, all we do is to exacerbate this nitrogen and phosphorus getting into the water. But they get in there in very different ways. And I kind of want to give you some examples on what climate change will affect and what will not affect. And nitrogen and phosphorus are pretty much like black and white in the sense that nitrogen uh, it's mostly, we find it mostly in the form of nitrate, NO3 right here. And if you see, you don't have, really have to take a close look to this diagram, but just to give you an idea that runoff and erosion in terms of nitrogen, it's, it's a pretty small error. You know, it's a pretty small flux of runoff. It doesn't really travel uh, over land. Instead, it leaches quite a bit. Nitrate tends to go to the groundwater pretty fast. And here's the diagram. Now, all, all a big part of what we put in the crops will end up into the groundwater, but it, it does go slowly in the groundwater. It generates this is, this is a pretty accurate scale 10, 20. By the time it reaches the creek, it's been 30 years. Obviously, we didn't start a cultivate yesterday, so we've been doing this for a while. And our groundwater usually has very high levels of nitrate. And this is something that increase extreme events, you know, climate change effects will not particularly affect that. Uh, in fact, I wanted to give you an example of White Clay Creek, again, from 1970. And this is considered not a bad stream around here at all. But if you notice um, sometime in here, when things were getting even worse, that's when all these BMPs and you know Stroud Center and, and friends started to be very active about this little watershed. And if you want to see it, you can say that it's going down. But the point I want to make is that even if we shut off everything we do in the watershed, it would take you know, decades to recover that nitrate level because right now it's in the groundwater. Those legacy effects, those, those parts of the global change that are not necessarily affected by the changes in the climate will, will, will take a long while. And some of these effects are, will not make them worse, will not make them better either. So in the case of nitrate and climate change, there's a little bit of a disconnection, at least, at least for nitrate. But the phosphorus story, it's very different. And I like these um, pie chart plots because they show that you know, most of the nitrogen that gets to a stream, it's this blue part, what we call base flow or groundwater, and a little bit is a storm flow. And for phosphorus, it's almost the, the opposite picture. Most of the phosphorus travel during storms and travels over land with those sediments. So for phosphorus, increasing these extreme events and this rinsing of the landscape does have tremendous consequences. And that's when the urban runoff in particular comes the biggest problem because that's where we have made a lot of impermeable surface. So we increase this runoff. There is this estimation of about half of the water that falls in an urban setting ends up straight away in the river. That will carry the pollutants, the phosphorus, and, and in, a, in, a, or in an ag setting as well, uh, a lot of phosphorus also reaches the stream during this overland runoff. But again, trying to be optimistic, this is very similar to what I was saying before that we've done in the watershed. This is the case for Baltimore and, and the Chesapeake Bay, I believe, that um, you know, they've been really able to show reductions in phosphorus loads during high storm events when there are more BMPs, best management practices in the, in the area. So again, by doing that, there is a you know, capability to mitigate this and, and things to do to, to stay uh, you know, on guard with, against this, these increased extreme events when it comes to phosphorus. There's hope, I guess. And lastly, but not least, which is probably the scariest one, is that, again, increasing the, the rinsing of the landscape, increasing the flushing of more extreme events and more rain will turn into whatever we have out there. 
there'll be more reaching the stream. And there are some pollutants that we barely know, like recently the PFAS and others that we don't know, but will surely show up. And others we thought that was not an issue. And now we're realizing that they might be like this last picture of salt. And I wanted to finish with something that we've been lately talking a lot here, it's mostly because our entomologist, John Jackson, has just got a, an interview by the Philadelphia Inquirer and got this article that got a lot of press about what happens when you know, we have all these road salt and the winter storms comes in. Maybe before they were snow, the, now more often than not, they might just be rain, which makes it even worse. All that salt is in the river. We have a long history of studying how salt affects uh, insects primarily. And obviously there's, there's some of these streams get so salty that uh, nobody who lives there is, is um, having a good time. But I wanted to point out the salt issue and kind of link to the beginning that you know, the first thing when you think of that is, well, winter storms and road salt. But in reality, again, not just the climate, it's the whole global change. Well, that salt is not disappearing. That salt also goes to our groundwater. And even in places, you know, not so much here out in my Foley Creek, but in other watersheds in, in the area, you know, we also see high salt levels in the summertime in the groundwater. And those are the sort of interactions between the climate and the changes we've done in the landscape that will really make it make it difficult to, to assess the whole effects. So I want to summarize what I, I think are the three you know, take home messages or things I, I, I like for you to, to remember. Um, first, that you know, compared to other ecosystems, there's a point to be made that stream communities are particularly vulnerable to global change effects, just because the way you know, they are designed, because they, they're the drain of everything else in the watershed, of the forest ecosystems, of the, of the uh, grassland ecosystems, the mountain ecosystems, they're all somehow at the end connected to the stream. So they're particularly vulnerable by being at the end of the line. This is my opinion, but, uh, but there's good data to make to support uh, this opinion is that one of the biggest effects of climate change impacts on streams is this affection of flow regime temperature too, and they really go hand by hand. And I didn't want to talk much about temperature because that would make this presentation twice as long, but mostly flow. You know, changing the flow first also change the temperature because you're talking on how much water is in there, less water, easier to warm up, more water, harder to warm up. Uh, when there is more water, when there is less water, it's usually the flow regime, it is, it is the, the most fundamental uh, variable that we can think of and it affects the communities, but also this um, amount of pollution or excessive nutrients or sediment that reach the stream because we are increasing the flashing, the, the rinsing of the landscape during extreme events. And unfortunately, it seems to be that this will happen more often than not in our region. And we should start, I really like what Tara was saying that we should really tell not just us, but the kids too on how to be prepared and keep active because it seems that it's only going to be worse than that. That's all I got. I hope I did well on time. Wow, Mark, thank you so much. I'm going to have to, every time I hear Mark speak about this, and it's like, I need to watch this, you know, 10 more times over. But luckily, we will have the recording. So um, anyone want to share anything or have questions for Mark, like takeaways? Yeah, um, Katie, did you want to say something? Or was that just a wave, like a yes, that was awesome. <laughs> Sorry, you're muted. <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. It was just like a, a clapping. That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Mark. That was, that was very insightful. Sure. And um, my pleasure. Yeah. Yeah, Mark is really good. I know, Kevin. Yeah, thinking about like being able to explain things. I tried, Kevin. Relatable. <laughs> the, ir the irony is that is the most difficult thing for me. So. <laughs> yeah, and that, I just wanted to comment on how the, the road salts are affecting our waterways was just absolutely stunning for me to just learn about the first time. Like it seems so obvious and it's just so important to keep getting that word out there. So kudos to Stroud for getting in the media. It's, it's awesome and very important. Yeah, kudos to John Jackson, two doors down the hallway. <laughs>
He's been really <laughs> leading the charge. But don't tell him I said that. <laughs> That's his feathers. But it's been happening for so long now, too. And it's like, when is this message going to finally gain traction? And there is like the opening finally happened, you know, because I know Shane's probably been witnessing it for a long time. Kevin's been witnessing it for a long time. We've all been seeing this happening in the streams. So it's just like, when is the public ready to grab onto the message? So just never give up on that part, you know, and students can help with this. You know, students really can help raise up these, um, these issues too. Yeah, Ingrid, did you wanna say something? Yeah, I just had a quick question, Mark. So if you're saying that the, the biggest impacts that they're seeing is to the flow regime and to the temperature, if um, we were doing um, community service activities and, and education and had monies, would it be um, more likely to put those into BMPs that affect that flow regime, like riparian repair, planting trees to help the temperature and things like that, instead of non-point source pollution um, remedies? Tough question, um, but I like it. I would say yes, in part because even, even when you do many of these things that might be primarily intention for flood mitigations, you're also helping um, other things that you mentioned, like reducing the pollutants load. You know, like think about a repairing buffer will not only help you reduce flood, but it will also take away some of that phosphorus, some of that sediment before it reaches the stream. So it's, it's all connected and you can really, cannot get it wrong by doing that. I think that's, that's the way I wanted to say that if you have to pick, you know, the one master variable, it's flow regime. And just go to, you know, go to the, go to the heart of the problem or, or one of the most elemental things on how these systems function. Obviously that will depend on, you know, the, the there are exceptions for sure. And you might be looking at a, at a, at a case where you want to do something else, but, I really think there's no, especially with planting trees, you know, the cost benefit is incredibly high. I mean, there's nothing like that. And not to say that other options are not valid, but that one in particular will, you'll check a lot of boxes by just doing something like that. Yeah. And, you know, we would like to use this watershed as an example of, obviously it's a small watershed and that makes things easier. Um, and we put a lot of effort, the restoration, the science, the education team, the partners, the Stroud family, everybody. So it might be a, an ideal scenario, but I really like the idea that there, in, in that sense, there are things we can do. You know, in some others, you know, might be too late, <laughs> but, but for this one, there's a lot to do to mitigate these extreme events and we should try. Any other thoughts or takeaways while we have Mark here with us before he returns to his jungle of children? <laughs> <laughs> are the That's a good way to put are it. they already asleep or are they? He's got three boys. Wow. Yeah. yeah. Anything else? Last thoughts? <laughs> hey, Tara, can I make one comment? Yeah, on, sure. on that last question, um, and we 100% agree with the trees and planting the trees and having them shade the creek, um, as well as sequester carbon and things like that. Um, but I just wanted to mention that some of the green infrastructure practice, practices that uh, collect the first flush of stormwater, so that's like the first, you know, inch of rain or so that that hits the ground, uh, collects some of that thermal pollution as well. So it does help to some degree with cooling, even if it's, you know, a stormwater basin of native plants and not necessarily all trees. There, there are some temperature benefits um, to that as well. Absolutely. And you have a program for that, right, in the watershed? Yeah, I'll be talking about that. <laughs> I'm repeating a lot of what you had, but with different images and particularly with the white clay. So I'm glad that we were on the, you know, I think what I have will, will complement oh, yeah. everything you said. Really, these, these simple things like helping somebody with their backyard and increase infiltration, right? Just, yeah. you, absolutely. you can't go wrong. I mean, there's, there's absolutely nothing that you're going to do wrong with that. 
I mean, you know, sometimes we have the preference or the, the idea that we should go in our work on the stream. And it's hard to say, well, maybe you should go up farther up. That's why I like the end of the line <laughs> idea, which you know, sometimes better to go to the root of the problem, which is trying to fix it up right there. Yep, go to the source. <laughs> as close to the source as you can. <laughs> Going once, going twice. Any more thoughts? All right, Mark, you are. You can be wild and be free. Thank you all for your work. <laughs> Most important one in the planet. <laughs> Bye. Thank you, Mark. Awesome. Yeah. Um, so the sign-in link should be. Good. I think I saw many of you actually signed in. So great. Thanks for doing that. Um, and there are sets of data, you know, that NOAA has that are available for like long term, you know, the 100 years or just a little bit under 100 years if you needed something, you know, because we're always like, where are we going to get local data to make this a localized experience or interpretation with students? And you can look at some of these um, snapshots, which you know can interpret something like the severe weather patterns that we are seeing and see where students can find, where am I on this map? You know, So um, there are good data, um, data sets out there. If you go to climate.gov, which we put in the wakelet, you can access them there. Um, really good questions. So we can take just a five minute pause while we swap out speakers and kind of get our feet wet in a different way. <laughs> so feel free to take a stretch break. Um, we, I can let you know there is an actual, probably not to do right now, but there is a YouTube video um, um, that you can, it's at White Clay Creek and you'll see someone that you recognize there doing a stretch actually a movement pattern. If you ever want to take a pause on the planet, what I call them. So. You can check that out. We put that in there too to do at some point in time if you want to go and get right in, in the white clay. So, um, but we'll be back probably like around just a little bit um, before seven and we'll start off with Shane. So feel free to come on back then.
Tara. Should I share my screen now just to have it ready? Or do did you have more you wanted to? Oh, you're muted. Okay. That's why I was like, hold on. Um, <laughs> I, do, I have a couple of questions in the Zoom poll that I wanted to give first as kind of like a wrap up from okay. and then we'll have you rock and roll. Um, but actually I can, yeah. All right. Give me a second. All right. Um, folks are popping back a little bit. I'm gonna see if this actually works. I haven't done the Zoom pool in a while, but um, there's just a few questions that I would love to have to ask you all. And as part of our grant with National Park Trust, because they have a climate change focus. And so I was just curious about, there's three questions. Um, you could let us know if you teach at all about climate change in your, any of your programming, whether you're a formal or informal educator, however you interact on the planet. <laughs> And if you can't see the question, then that means your Zoom version is is needs to be updated. But <laughs> just curious if any of you have, teach about climate change. And we'll give another five more seconds for folks to answer. <laughs> all right. Can you all see the answers as they're popping up already? Yeah, OK. So it looks like we've got more than not that I get to teach about climate change. Awesome, thank you. Um, and I'll share the results. <laughs> All right. Just curious because every state is different and um, how they actually emphasize or encourage or not. Yeah. All right, so let me get to the next question, which is just about your comfortability about teaching climate change. So on a scale of one to five, how comfortable are you about teaching anything related to climate change before tonight? <laughs> so before tonight. How about you, Jasmine? <laughs> My co-host tonight, who's gonna probably end this meeting soon and just be like, boom. <laughs> All right, so we'll give a few more seconds. We have 10 of 15 participating. You don't have to, but um, tell us if you're, how comfortable you are teaching about climate change. All right, there are the results. So we've got quite a, a range of people tonight that have, like, can teach about it, feel comfortable. So hopefully tonight we can help you with a little bit about this too. And then um, the last question is just about climate change resources. Do you know where to go for credible climate change resources, including data, um, videos, anything that's supportive for you as an educator? And that's prior to the night also. <laughs> that caveat. Okay. 
All right, thanks everyone for participating. Jasmine. <laughs> and those are the results. Cool. All right, so we will move on. And Shane, if you would like to begin and introduce yourself, that would be wonderful. Thank you. So we'll move on to our next presenter, Shane Morgan. Okay. Let me let me get set up before I start talking or else I can't figure out what I'm doing with Zoom. So on one second. Okay. Um, so hi everyone. My name is Shane Morgan and I am the director of the White Clay Wild and Scenic River Program. And I'm basically going to take you all um, through a little bit of history about the watershed and then go into some of the stressors, which Mark also hit on, and some of the solutions, um, some that we think you might be able to employ with your students as well. So first of all, um, a little bit about the geography of the white clay for those of you who may not know um, exactly where we are. Um, I know some of you are from from within the watershed. But if you look at the map in this upper right corner, you can see where we're situated, um, pretty close to Wilmington between Lancaster and Philadelphia. And we're a bi-state watershed. So about 55% of our land uh, lies in Pennsylvania and the other 45% is in Delaware. Um, it's about 107 square miles and we have 199 miles of streams that are protected under the Wild and Scenic River Act, which I will talk about a little bit later. Um, so a little bit about the history. Our Watershed Association was formed in 1965 um, and it was a group that was galvanized around a dam that was supposed to go up in the White Clay Creek. It was going to be um, a rather large dam that was going to be used for a drinking water water source for Newcastle County, Delaware residents. And uh, I just like this picture. This is a, a bumper sticker um, that a, a local resident had made and uh, other um, people who visited the area saw this bumper sticker and it kind of galvanized the group together, people from Delaware and Pennsylvania um, around a common cause about what was going on in the white clay and, and how they didn't want uh, the, the river to be dammed. And I'll show you why. Uh, so this is an artist's rendition of the dam. Um, it's right below the Delaware state line. Um, you can see it's, it's it's rather large. It's not like those historic mill dams that, that we do have uh, spread out through, through, through the white clay as well as other um, rivers really in the Northeast area or mid-Atlantic, I should say here. Um, and this, this dam was basically gonna form a reservoir that went all the way back um, up the east and middle branches um, and flooded these areas uh, right here. And so this group of people who, who really enjoyed the area for birding, for hiking, um, for, for its aquatic resources. Uh, they, they didn't want this to happen. They knew it was a bad thing. So what they did was they formed this group, which incorporated in 1965 to be the Watershed Association. And they were able to prove that um, the census data that, that had the population growing like exponentially um, was, was incorrect. Uh, it, did, it was going to grow, but it wasn't gonna grow so much that it would, um, need additional water resources. There were plenty of water, drinking water resources available at the time, and they got University of Delaware involved in this, and, and they were able to, to prove to the uh, local congressmen uh, and elected officials that, that it wasn't really necessary. And they won that fight, which is pretty incredible. So at the same time, the, Wild and, the Congress was passing the Wild and Scenic Rivers Act. So that happened in 1968. And basically, well, the that was put into place because Congress saw that um, a lot of the rivers across the United States were being dammed for these, mainly for hydroelectric power, um, and that they wanted to have some course of action to protect some free flowing rivers in their natural state. Okay, they saw the value in that. So they enacted this law. This group, um, this is all going on simultaneously. So the plans for the dam are abandoned and it was DuPont who was buying up the land, mind you, I, sh I should have mentioned that earlier. And what's incredible about this whole situation is that he was buying up the land um, and this is what became the original bi-state preserve right here. And it kind of looks like the reservoir, right? Because this is the land that he was buying up or the company was buying up, I should say, for that 
reservoir for the purposes of that. And what they did was they donated this land to form the bi-state preserve. So what was going to be like an ecological disaster actually turned out to be um, quite a blessing for this watershed. And, and so the watershed association then decided, you know what, we don't wanna have to go through this again. We're gonna petition Congress to do a study of the White Clay Creek. We think it has outstanding resources that are worthy of protection. Uh, they thought they had the local um, buy-in from the municipalities and the two states um, to do this. And um, they, they won. And actually it was, I believe, Senator Joe Biden at the time who helped them get this passed. Um, and so, a river study ensued for about, I don't know, seven to eight years, I believe, and a watershed management plan came out of that. And they deemed, uh, Congress decided, and National Park Service, who helped with the study, that this was a river that was eligible for protection. And so in 2000, it was signed into law, and the White Clay Creek um, gained that uh, designation. And it was also the first Wild and Saint River to be protected on a watershed basis, meaning all the land that drains to the river, which is exactly what um, I think Tara brought up in the beginning. So, so what does it mean to be a wild and scenic river? Um, first of all, it's a really special designation, um, less than 1%, it's like less than half of 1% of all rivers in the United States have this designation. So special in that manner. Um, we are also a partnership wild and scenic river, which sets us apart from other rivers because we're not um, federally managed and there's no federally owned land in the watershed. So we're locally managed. We, we rely on ordinances um, and local municipalities and county agencies to manage the watershed um, in a way that really won't um, degrade it. Um, so, but with that, we do get extra federal oversight. So for instance, if there's a project like say a bridge crossing um, that's gonna impact the better banks of the creek and they have to go get a permit to do that, that permit will then get flagged and it will go to National Park Service for extra review. And then they can make comments and suggestions on it and they work it out with the other federal agencies. Um, and then you know, hopefully whatever project goes in will have a minimal impact. It should have no adverse impact on the creek, but. I'm just saying minimal for now. Um, we also get federal funding from the National Park Service. So every year we get a budget um, to implement projects in the watershed management plan. And that is um, a, a huge resource for this area. So we can do projects anywhere throughout the watershed, um, as long as they are in line with our goals set forth in that plan. So for some of you who are not in the area, even though all of you are probably very familiar with Piedmont streams, yeah, even the person down in South Carolina is probably looks familiar to you as well. This is the middle branch of the White Clay Creek um, in one of Franklin Township's preserves. And it's one of my favorite spots. But this is, I mean, this is the beauty of the creek, especially in that heart uh, of, of the watershed where the land was preserved. Um, this is down on the Delaware side. It's a a popular spot for hikers, bikers, even fishermen in the creek. Um, and this is very close to where that proposed dam was going to go up that I showed you pictures of. Here's some more. Uh, this is a popular swim spot on the Pennsylvania side. Uh, and again, it's, it's just a very pretty Piedmont type of stream with ridges and valleys throughout. Um, we do have a lot of ag land and they offer different types of views, um, sometimes just as beautiful, um, but we, I, I did want to get a picture of that in here. And then it's it's in the wintertime, it's just as serene and, and beautiful and you can see further. So sometimes it's cool when you're up on a ridge and you can look down and see the creek. Um, and when other times it's completely hidden by trees. If you want to see more, we do have a, a virtual tour on our website that you can you can find it on our website. And basically we selected a few spots throughout the watershed. Um, there's an interactive map where you can click on these little diamonds um, and they will give you information about the site. There's usually a trail um, associated with it that you can take a hike on. Um, we did this mainly because of COVID and we wanted to still get people out and celebrate the White Clay Creek, but it is um, eternally living on our website because it's been a, a resource that people have been using. So please feel free to visit um, virtually if you can't come here in person. So what are the stressors or challenges to the watershed? Um, 
I tried to get a better stock photo of, of people, <laughs> but really we are the stressor um, with, with, this is New York City, but you know, with people, you get more roads, you get more buildings, you get more impervious surface, you have more pollution, whether it's air pollution, water pollution. Um, we, we make changes to the landscape that, that really do um, affect what happens down the stream. Um, and here's like more a typical situation in white clay. Um, this is not taken from white clay, but it's a suburban development. So you get the idea, houses, roads, sidewalks, driveways, American lawn, all these things that kind of banish um, nature and natural features to like the outskirts where you can't, where you can't build. Um, and these create different problems. Um, nutrients come from lawns as well, um, and then run off from all the impervious and whatever other chemicals you might put on your property or on your road, like salts, um, as Mark had mentioned. So the land use in, in White Clay Creek is, is, is varied. We're about a third developed. So the yellow and the red are the developed areas, red being more of the commercial development. We're forested about a third, but you can see how fragmented it is, these green pieces. So a lot of it has been you know, destroyed for other uses. And we're about a third agriculture and most of the agriculture in Pennsylvania, especially in this upper uh, area um, and where Stroud is, but they've been doing a lot of work here, which is great. Um, this is the, from the 2010 census, the orange layer is, is considered the urbanized area. So that's where most of the people reside, which matches up with this map as well. Here's the bi-state preserve and most of our forest land. And here's, again, where, where most of the large landowners are with agricultural properties. So, these are all from white clay, these photos. And I, I, I didn't know that Mark was gonna focus on flow regime, uh, but that is actually, um, as someone who's more of a practitioner in the watershed, that's what we focus on as well. So uh, problems arise when you don't manage stormwater. You know, here's, this, this is stormwater from a, a old development that was put up probably in the 60s. It has no stormwater management because we didn't, we didn't do, we didn't, do stormwater management probably until 1990, like where we really started putting in um, structures that capture stormwater from the developments that we create. And so every time it rains, even though there's a lot of trees in this um, neighborhood, there's still a lot of runoff. And you can see the sediment coming from uh, running off from people's driveways and their yards um, and, and whatever else. There's no ag field up here causing, causing that sedimentation going to the creek. And it, it literally flows right down into the creek. And like Mark said, there's a lot of stuff in the water that we can't see. We can see the dirt and we know that with that dirt, Things are other things are being washed off and, and brought to the creek, um, but more even more recently we're seeing road blowouts. So this was a blowout in 2018 when we did have all that rain from from a, a stream that barely is a trickle most times of 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 the year. But this is a big storm event. It was one of those more intense ones with like a five inch rain. I think we had five inches in less than an hour and it blew out a lot of roads, especially in the red clay watershed next to us. But this was one that happened uh, locally. And so we, we're seeing a lot more of that and bridge blowouts as well on, on some of the smaller streams. Um, we also see the flooding. This is down in Newark. Um, this happens quite frequently. This is at the bottom of our watershed. We see flooding everywhere though. Uh, we saw flooding. Uh, this is, I, I think this was Ida. I can't remember if it was Ida or, or, the, or the one the year before. But for those of you that are from here, this is Lantana Shopping Center. Car floated and wound up going into their stormwater management uh, systems and clogging it. Um, no one got hurt, but it was it was quite a scene uh, to see within our watershed. And then we also have, you know, the construction runoff and the ag uh, field runoff when there's large intense rain events as well as things that get in the water that we can't see all the time. Um, this was a fish kill in the white clay. I want to say maybe six years ago, um, and it was hard to pinpoint the source, but we think it was chemicals that were used to put out a, a hay bale fire that had eventually run off into the creek. Um, so there's all, all sorts of things from our impact from land use um, that get into the get into the water um, and either polluted or cause flooding and other flow regime issues. So again, as Mark said, climate change exacerbates 
exacerbates these stressors, right? So we've been seeing a lot more wet weather. Um, this is from the National Centers for Environmental Information, but basically one of the wettest years, and this is, it's not the year, because it's February, 2018 to 2019, but it's the wettest 12 month average we've seen in Chester County. So that year we had 72 inches of rain and our normal rainfall is around 44 inches. Um, and since 2000, we have seen that average increase every year and the Chester County uh, Water Resource Agency just put out a report on this. And they, they think that the 12 months average is, is, is going, is. Sorry, I don't know how long I was muted, but I'm gonna keep going. Um, wet weather events, um, more intense rain events, you know, a lot more rain in a shorter period of time. I think these are trends that, that aren't going away um, and that cooperate with what uh, Mark had said earlier. So these are some of the other issues with, with climate change, right? With these intense, more uh, wet weather events, we're seeing a lot of extreme flooding, right? So those of you from the Philly area, yeah, I remember seeing this and being stunned. Uh, this is the Vine Street Expressway. So, you know, trucks, uh, cars, 18 wheelers go under this bypass. This is a highway. It was filled with water after Ida. Um, don't do this, uh, not suggested. Um, but some people thought it was a funny photo op. So we're seeing intense flooding that we've never seen before. Again, Mark showed Brandywine uh, flooding in Wilmington. I'm showing you it in Chad's Ford. This is where the Brandywine River Museum is, where Hanks is. Um, it was completely devastated during Ida. And it, it was the biggest flood on record that they had that they had ever seen or have on record. Um, this is in White Clay. This is actually in the upper, this is in the upper watershed. It is in the East Branch. Um, and it's kind of, uh, it's it's a burrow that that has a lot of impervious surface, but really the drainage area is above it. Um, and when you have these intense rain events, you're you're seeing more um, flooding in areas that maybe you 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 didn't always see it historically. So this is like a one in one hundred year flood that they've seen now two years in a row. So. What are we, you know, what are our ways of address, addressing these issues? So I see, I kind of, I put the stool here because I see it as a, like a three-pronged approach. Um, we, we do education and outreach. We talk to people about these issues. We try and get them to understand them. Um, uh, we try and teach solutions to them. We, we also um, put a lot of our funding into land preservation. So preserving land so that it can't be developed, um, preserving land that contains uh, healthy forests or healthy riparian buffers. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's as important as doing restoration. Um, and then the third one is restoration, which includes monitoring. Um, and we do have a water quality monitoring program where, where we try and uh, identify areas or hotspots um, where we could be doing work and also to follow some trends in the watershed. But restoration is what I'm going to focus on um, uh, for the majority of this talk. Um, and that's basically what are we doing to um, remediate or ameliorate some of these effects that we're seeing. Oh, so I have a slide on education. Basically, you know, we do a lot of um, volunteer planting projects where I'll invite either students out or uh, the community out to do a planting. Um, and then I talk about why we're doing it, what the purpose is of it, how the plants help and things like that. So I'm trying to really, um, you know, impress upon people the idea that they can be a part of the solution as much you know, as much as we are part of the problem, we can also be the solution. We also do workshops for uh, municipalities, elected officials and um, municipal staff um, so that they feel more comfortable understanding what some of the solutions are that they can use um, that, you know, and we like to push the green infrastructure versus just using gray infrastructure like drainage uh, and drains and, you know, uh, pipes and things like that. We're, we're more into things you can see on the land, nature-based, um, that have layered benefits. Um, we have signage that we use at some of our um, demonstration sites so that we can educate people passively as they're walking by. And I'll talk more about the, the project in the upper right in a little bit. 
And we do an annual event, the White Clay Creek Fest, which is held at the state park. It's always the first Saturday in May, um, and we're happy to be doing it live again this year. So if you're in the area, um, please feel free to um, come on out and join us. So back to land preservation, we, we do support a lot of uh, preservation and this is all the open space uh, that has been preserved, all these different things. This is ag easements up here, um, uh, conservation easements and, and protected open space, municipal open space all in one. So you can see we do have quite a bit of, of protected open space here. Um, I know we're over 20%, I'm not sure what the exact number is, but. But with that open state space, besides protecting the land, we're also sometimes we get trail easements uh, that come along with these properties, which also helps get people out and into the watershed so that they can feel a part of it, um, so that they're more in touch and in tune with nature. Um, if, they, if they love a place, they're more likely to want to steward it um, or protect it or put more funding into open space. So I think there's a real connection with the trails and getting people out there um, doing projects on these properties as well, um, as well as the inherent benefits of protecting it, you know, just for, just for the sake of protecting the natural resources. So in terms of restoration work we do, like I said, we push the, the nature-based solutions to stormwater management, which is just another way of saying green stormwater infrastructure. Um, we are 100% behind riparian buffers. This is one uh, that we did um, that was re recently planted. Um, this is the day of the planning. And here's one that's a little bit older. This one was on ag, uh, agricultural land where we, we were able to implement a buffer with Stroud um, in, in this case. This is a basin retrofit. So if you guys are familiar with stormwater management and some of the newer developments, you'll see these large basins. Lots of times they're just mowed. Other times they're, they're neglected. Um, sometimes uh, an organization like us will come in and say, hey, can we do a retrofit here? And we try and um, get people to think differently about that basin as actually a place that you can enjoy. Um, so here we did a native plant uh, a project where we tried to get the water to stay in the basin longer by uh, elongating the flow path and using native plants. So you can't even see that there's any microtopography going on in this basin, but you can see the beauty of the native plants and the wildlife it supports. Um, and, and so that's, that's, an, that's one of the practices that we definitely uh, support and, and emphasize. And here's a smaller scale rain garden, same idea. This is a residential property with a storm drain going to a basin, kind of, I'm gonna call it a basin, but you're just digging out the soil about a foot deep so that it holds that rainwater and infiltrates, infiltrates it. And you plant it with native plants. So, you know, it's great to watch. It's fun to watch in a storm event, um, as well as it is when it's not storming and you have insects and butterflies and birds visiting it. So, I talked about open space, I, but I also wanted to bring up the fact that 88% um, of White Clay Creek is privately owned. And um, if you're from Pennsylvania and, and you know, Delaware might not be as, as stringent as uh, Pennsylvanians, but we love our private property, right? We want keep off my private, private property, right? We don't want people coming in and doing things or telling us what we should be doing. Um, however, if we really want to make a difference in this watershed, we need to reach out to private landowners and we need to get them on board with, with the solution. And so one of the programs that we started in 2016 is called Catch the Rain Program. And it's exactly what I'm saying. The, the goal is to, to catch the rain, okay? So we offer uh, incentives, monetary incentives for voluntary implement, implementation of nature-based practices. So if this is a before, picture of a, a typical suburban home and you can see the roof water you know just coming on out makes it to the street which eventually goes to a storm drain or a creek at the lowest point um, it comes down the sidewalks it comes down the driveway and it comes across the lawn because like I said lawns that are mowed uh, on a regular basis really do do very little 
for infiltration. And so we encourage practices uh, like reducing lawn and putting in native plant gardens or rain gardens to catch some of the, the stormwater, pervious pavers, so taking out asphalt and putting in uh, permeable pavers, which have, uh, they can drain and they often have like a storage basin underneath like 12 inches of drainage rock and stuff where they can store extra water. Um, and planting trees. We encourage tree plantings. Even on residential properties, we encourage the planting of trees um, because they are really one of our most cost-effective ways of, of combating some of these issues. And so I just wanted to, to show you some examples of what residential, um, some residential, some HOA land um, property owners have done. And so here's one in the city of Newark. It's really in, one of our more urbanized areas, even though it doesn't really look urban. Uh, she wanted to um, redo her driveway. So we suggested permeable pavers. We also suggested a rain garden. Uh, you can see here the gutter coming down. This collects all the water from the front two roofs. And it, sends, it originally was sending it to the lawn, which then went out to the road, which then went to the drain. Um, so we wanted to try and capture that. Um, and and that's what we did in this situation. Here's another one. Uh, it, this is more of a typical suburban yard that we have. This, this actually was right after Ida. We installed it. Uh, it was installed right before Ida hit and it wasn't mulched yet. So that's why this is so dirty. But you can see that we can see that the, the, the rain garden is working. It's holding the water. That's what it's supposed to do. It, this one actually had great drainage drained within a day. Um, and it gave us a chance to tweak some things like we had we saw we had to dig this out a little bit to make it more level here um, and so I can't wait to see this one this year when when the plants actually fill in this was a large landowner in the watershed and he had part of the middle branch running through it we noticed that he had you know there's trees that are along the creek and that's great it's better than nothing right it provides some shade for the water but it doesn't do as much in terms of filtering what's coming down uh, uh the hill into the property or what's what's hitting uh the floodplain right here and so we always encourage 100 foot buffers if you can do it uh, and in this case, we were able to do that, and this property owner agreed to it. Um, he had me out for a regular catch the rain visit, and this is the project that came out of it. Here's another one. I showed a picture of this one earlier. This was at an HOA where I went out to someone's house. They had already gardened every inch of it. There wasn't much to do on his property, but he happened to be a member of the HOA board. So I asked him if he had open space. We walked her and we found a, a planting opportunity, and he was able to get his homeowners association board. Um, to agree to it. Um, so that was another practice that came out of this program. And then we, we did some demonstration gardens. So this was working, I said we do municipal education. So this was a chance to educate uh, a municipality that's uh, it's West Grove Borough. So it's more one of our more urbanized or built out boroughs, even though it's a small part of the watershed. And the manager there was willing to put a rain garden in here. So this is the municipal building. It also doubles as the library. Um, it's a great spot for foot traffic. And so we dug this all the grass out and basically the gutters from this roof it was like 1300 square feet go to this spot here it is six weeks after it was planted we had one of those major storm events um i was extremely concerned about it but the garden held up and you can see it looks like a little mini lake here this is three months later um, the plants are really filling in and this is a year later and now we have a sign up so it greets people and it tells people you know what the purpose of the rain garden is why it's there brings them through the photos of uh, how it was installed and what it looked like during different events so that one worked out well. We decided to put another demonstration garden in at a park where it's taking uh, some storm water from, from the parking lot here. Um, this one went in in October of last year. And again, we got another big rain event right after we planted it. Um, so you can see this is what a rain garden does. It holds the water. See how it's level, it holds it. Eventually, if it's going to overflow, it'll overflow uh, across this little berm here. Um, but it held that water. This is 24 hours later, you see a little bit of water in there. This is 48 hours, it's completely drained. Um, so again, looking forward to seeing this one this year as well. So I'm going to end like my part of the, the conversation by showing 
you an activity that I use to kind of illustrate the benefits of these nature-based practices, um, especially when you're talking about climate change and a, a wetter climate, which is what we will be experiencing here. So, so basically we take, um, and I know that Tara has some of this in the wakelet. I think some of this is in the wakelet or, or somewhere she's gonna be sharing information with you, but these are paint trays, um, right? Where you put your paint roller and, and whatnot and the paint sits at the bottom here. And basically what we did is we turned them into to neighborhoods um, with a lot of impervious surface, either parking lot or roads and buildings. And then each one of these bins has sponges in it that represent a different practice, um, like either a rain garden or a rain barrel um, and or tree plantings and things like that. And what we do is we ask um, people, it could be kids or it could be um, adults at a, at a uh, another like catch the rain workshop or uh, municipal officials that we're trying to uh, you know educate about what green stormwater infrastructure is and basically we ask them to put things around one of the one of the needs and then we take the same amount of water and we pour it on each right and we use a strainer so that it's like it's raining and we ask them to look at how much water makes it to the creek which is this area here and you can see it's visible to the eye. You can measure it, but sometimes that's hard to do when you're at a community event, but you can see all the water winds up in the river here, right? Whereas here, sometimes none of it, depending how much they put on the tray makes it there, but you can see an obvious decrease in the water that runs off. And it really makes that connection um, to people. And it's really fun to see that light bulb go off, go off that, okay, this is what a rain garden does. This is what a tree does. This is, this is what, what happens when you start, you know, living more equitably with nature um, instead of just banishing it to, to the outskirts, right? You bring it in, it helps with infiltration, it helps to soak up the rain, um, and it has a myriad of other benefits as well. So, so I wanted to end end on that and give credit to Carnegie Mellon because they developed this idea and we just kind of took it and um, adapted it to our program. So this picture here was more for a city environment, you know, where you might want green roof and urban forest um, and more grassy spaces. But for us, we use it for rain gardens, um, uh, rain barrels, tree plantings and conservation landscaping are the four main practices that I that I try to promote through the program. And so that is all that I have. Uh, if you have questions about anything or want to reach out to me, this is how you can reach me. And I think that's also in the wakelet. Um, so please feel free. And I'm going to stop sharing. Does anyone have any questions? I went really fast. <laughs> Yeah, that was very interesting, Shane. Really, really cool. There's a lot in the chat just talking about, like from Tim too, about just reliving some of these um, instances. They're just such extreme weather events that are so incredible to witness, especially through the pictures. You've done, and when Shane says we've done this, she's really the one that's been done, done it, you know, with volunteers, but she has been like spreading all of this. So she's a one woman show. Amazing, amazing. So <laughs> thank you. Anyone have a question for Shane? Go ahead and unmute yourself. Yeah. Yeah, this is Ingrid. I had one quick question. Where do you source most of, uh, most of your plants that you're using? So the trees, we, we, we try and source most of it locally. The trees usually come from Octorera Nursery, um, which is out near Oxford. If, if you're familiar with this area, it's down Route 1, like towards Maryland. Um, and the plants I get from North Creek, which is right here in Landenburg. They grow them here. You have to pick them up in Oxford, but um, they're fabulous. Um, so there's other ones too, like Prairie Moon. Um, we use Ernst for seed, like sometimes. So that rep, the basin retrofit I showed you was a native plant planting from North Creek plugs, but we also seeded over it um, just because there's such area to cover um, with, with native seeds as well. And can I ask one more question? Absolutely. So, so on the um, our water system at, at their main building, they did like a, a rain demonstration rain garden. But uh, do you have like some agreements, or you give them instructions on how to take care of it once it's planted? Yeah. So what what happens is they fill out a form, which it's a Google form, so it 
it gives me enough information to go on before I go out and do a site visit. And I go to Chesco Views and I get a map of the property um, and I look at the topography and I have an idea of where, I have an idea of what I'm, what I'm going to be looking at before I even go out there. And I bring that with me. I print out a copy of their, of their property. Um, and then I meet with the homeowner. It's usually about an hour. We walk around the property talk about stormwater, we talk about where their water is coming from and what their opportunities are. And then I put together a, re a report for them that outlines the different practices we talked about. Um, it's in, I put together a con like, it's a very conceptual map of where these practices can go, uh, sizes for the rain garden, things like that. I size it based on their roof or whatever area is draining to, to the spot. Um, and then they get a massive list of attachments from me um, that talk about how to do a rain garden because a lot of these people do it themselves. Um, I have contractor lists of people that know how to do this stuff that we hand out in case some people do want to use a contractor. Um, plant selections, plant lists, tree lists, where to source those. Um, so they get a whole packet of information. And then there is a maintenance plan as well um, because, you know, I always say this to people, a plant is not your, uh, a garden is not your living room, right? You don't have a designer come out and design your, your living room and expect it to change. But when you're dealing with a living environment, it's going to change and you're going to have to do work in it. So, you know, we try and put together a maintenance schedule that people can, can understand. Um, I'm always available to come out and do another consult, which I have done uh, with some property owners. They'll reach out to me a second time. And then we have a homeowner agreement, um, which is, it's really more like a pledge, like, you know, we are going to maintain this. If we move, we are going to let the next owner know uh, what was put in here and how to maintain it. And, and so, so it, it really is kind of more of like an, I guess, an honor system. I was curious, um, I do a big unit with my students about stormwater management and I have them do kind of small scale what you did. Like they do their backyard and they have to walk around and find areas. But at some point I wanted to, them to do an actual planning of a rain garden or something at our school. Do you visit schools and like, would you, or do you just, would you share? Cause I'm up in Pennsylvania though. So like in downtown. Yeah. So I do, but I have to work in with, so our fund, Funding is specifically for white clay watershed. Um, so that is actually one of the first questions I asked on my Google form. Do you live in the white clay watershed? And lots of times people say yes, but then I ask for their address and you can map it out and see. And I always feel bad when people don't fall into the watershed because I, I, you know, I'm willing to share resources, but I can't go out and do a site visit unless it's, or, or provide a monetary uh, incentive unless it's within the boundaries of the watershed. But I can recommend Brandywine Red Clay Lines if you're in Downingtown. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I would reach out to them. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. And Linda, I'm, a, I'm in Downingtown and we have a native plant group called Restore Our Roots, which um, we started a couple of years ago. I'll put that in there. And we have a planting around Earth Day weekend after that, Saturday after. So I'll um, pop that in the chat right now, just... Um, and it made me think, Shane, more about, we're going to, we're thinking about doing the um, wildlife community habitat certification. So, um, you know, we would love to talk with you more actually, our native plant group about all of this um, being in the brandy wine up there. So, so absolutely. And, and then one more thing for, for you, Linda, I do think that Brandywine Red Clay would be interested in your project specifically because it's a school project. So if you reach out to them, I would reach out to Brian Winslow um, and let him know what you're interested in because because they might take an interest in that. I know they like to do some of those types of projects. They don't have a program like Catch the Rain, but they do do these types of, of, of projects on, on more institutional properties, I would say. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I said, so do I have time to answer one more question, Tara? Because I see one in the chat. Yeah, and there was one about your background, Shane. Is that the one you're going to answer? Yes. Yeah, so, so I went to Penn State and I got a degree in environmental resource management, which is really, you know, it's kind of what I do now. Um, but it took me a while to get to this point. Um, I also uh, have an ecology background from Drexel University. Um, I thought I was going to go that more academic route, um, but then I decided that wasn't for me. So I started a landscape design business um, 
uh, called The Giving Garden. It was ecological landscape design. I probably did it for about 15 years. Um, and basically it's similar to Catch the Rain. Um, but when this opportunity came up to work for the white clay, um, I wanted to do it because this really kind of fits, fits, it hits every dot, right? So I get to work on a multitude of different projects and I'm not just catering to people who can afford to do landscape design. So it just, um, it just seemed like a natural cycle, but that's, that's pretty much it. So I have a, I have a plant background. I have horticulture uh, uh, certificates from, um, from, oh my gosh, I'm blanking out, Longwood Gardens. Um, and when I originally worked out of college, I worked at Swarthmore College um, and I worked with plant ecologists there. So I learned a lot about native plants um, and it kind of, you know, again, it was a circular path from academia to plants to the watershed, so. See if there's any more in the chat to discuss. Yeah, Timmy, sure. Yeah. There's a I, so and follow up on small and large projects. I'm, really, I'm seeing that one. Like, um, I do follow up. So before they get a rebate, they have to pay for it and do it. And then they have to have me out to do a final inspection. So I do do that. Um, it depends on what the project is. If it's a rain garden, I definitely like to go out and follow up because I think they need the most... Um, support people who put the rain gardens in. If it's a tree planting, that's pretty easy. I don't always follow up on that. Um, it depends. Uh, most of the time, people who do projects will follow up with me <laughs> and ask a question or ask me to come out again. Um, and, uh, you know, usually if I can fit in and I'll do it, but you're right, it is a lot of time. Um, so I don't advertise the program uh, widely. It's all word of mouth. In the beginning, we did some advertising. Every once in a while, someone does an article, and then I get like an uptick in applicants, but that's kind of how we've been managing the program for now. Excellent. Thank you, Shane. Awesome. And yeah, we'll do a follow-up email with everybody's um, connections and emails. And she's she's been in all of the emails so far too that have been going out about the workshop. So Wonderful, wonderful. Well, we've only got like 15 minutes left and we are going to be sharing, we need to share some resources. And we did put um, Shane's PDF of that activity into the wakelet. So you have that um, if you want to refer to it. Um, so let me share my screen just a little bit before we bring on Elena. And um, we're going to dive into now the resources, but I wanted to talk a little bit about um, this idea and Elaine is here in our education department, so excited to have her with us. Um, but I wanted to talk about, you know, what is climate or ecological resilience? Because we hear a lot about this word resilience when it comes to communities and human um, aspects of it. But I don't know if you want to type in the chat any ideas that you have about the effects and what it means, resiliency means to freshwater systems. And you can feel free to unmute yourself too, because um, it's really good to bring in this angle too. Again, most of what I've seen online only talks about um, the effects of communities and people and how they are resilient, but this affects all of us, right? This affects um, everything in the watershed. So how is the water resilient? How are the macroinvertebrates that are in the stream resilient to climate shifts, you know? so. Um, just some food for thought here. And if anyone has anything in the chat that they can think of, that might be an interesting kind of aha with resilience and thinking about it. But, you know, it, it does revolve with some about, about some of these words, you know, how resilient, going back to, again, um, macroinvertebrates, if you know them, fish, like they all have some, most of them have their special thermal tolerance levels, right? They can only take so much of a change in temperature and structure and pollution and um, shifts in their home, right? Each one of us may only be so resilient to our own home environment changing. So this is a really good one to ponder with, um, with students, especially just to open up a conversation about when you're talking about anything that relates to the effects of climate change and what could it have on some of the flora and the fauna, right? And phenology. So just wanted to pop that in there. 
And speaking of climate resilience, um, Elena, I guess I'll just drive the slide since we're here. Elena is going to start presenting on a bunch of resources that we have vetted and put in the wakelet. She's going to give you some like highlights of what's so good about each one of these. So Elena, feel free to take it from here. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm just pulling that up on my screen as well. Um, and so one of the first resources we see on the wakelet is Project WET's uh, teacher training, as well as uh, inside those links, you can find educator guides, downloadable activity booklets, um, and these products are available for anywhere from like ages pre-K all the way up through 12. Uh, you'll see some of the following resources are focused just on high schoolers, just on middle schoolers. Uh, what's really unique about Project WET is they also have WET Connect, so it's available one-year program for educator training. Um, and it's pretty much all inclusive. A lot of these resources go really deep into these subjects. Um, so once you get clicking and get started on the links that we give you, uh, there's a lot of information there. We don't, unfortunately, can't get all into it today. Um, the Wet Connect does touch upon uh, really defining the difference between weather and climate, greenhouse effect, and it does touch upon the aquatic invasive species, waterborne disease, and things that we might see in a changing climate. Next to the second resource is out of Pacific Institute. Um, she, uh, Tara mentioned the water resilience, and that's the ability of the water itself and the, the systems, how it functions, uh, and it's, ability to return to its own functions so that it benefits both the nature and people, um, especially the people that are on the front lines of the impacts um, and those disproportionately impacted, uh, making sure that they thrive and not just survive when they have these impacts of flooding or stresses or loads of VOCs or PFAs. Uh, those kind of people that could be disproportionately impacted are economically uh, segregated, regionally segregated, um, but especially BIPOC peoples, Black, Indigenous, people of color are usually the forefront impacted. Um, and some of those words, persistency, adaptability, transformability, all talk about our communities and the water's ability to reform, return to its natural functions, and to plan for events that we might not be able to predict yet. On to the third resource. And this is a very deep resource, the globalchange.gov. Um, within this, you can find toolkits, a two-part toolkit of wildlife and wildlands toolkit. There's a lot of videos on there. Some of them are through the National Park Service. Uh, you can see a picture down in the lower right-hand corner down here, I don't have screen share, um, which is modeling the glacial melt and its correlation to sea level rise. Because this is a conversation I have a lot um, with people while talking about climate change, and it's a great way to get students of all ages the visual aid that it is happening, the impact that it has globally, and really how we can navigate this going forward. Um, one of the other projects that you can see here on globalchange.gov, because they also have um, lesson plans and activities you can roll out uh, specifically for birds, for our flora, fauna, um, and so start to bring some of these communities into the classroom. Um, and one thing I'd like to touch upon here, which might be new, maybe to use educators, but also definitely to the students, is the concept of climate literacy. Um, a climate literate person is someone that could understand the essential principles of the Earth climate system, to know how to access the scientifically credible information, um, and that they have the right words to communicate about climate and climate change. Uh, making sure that we can all make informed, responsible decisions. So really putting the right tools and language in the hands of the people that are learning um, is that our responsibility as educators, making sure that we're prepared with the right tools and words and language. Uh, I want to stop for a second and say maybe I'd skimmed over, but a lot of these resources are supported 
by either the national science education standards. Um, a lot of them fit directly into common core standards because I know that's really important to, um, to meet. Uh, a lot of these activities are directly supportive of STEM and STEAM curriculum. And then more specifically, some of them are curated directly by NOAA and national and international governing bodies. All right, and so this one, speaking of international governing bodies, I believe is a, comes from a paleontological, paleontological research institution. Um, and so we don't always think of that being maybe at the forefront of climate change, but within this, the teacher friendly guide, we have, um, this, is, this one is mostly specific for high school educators and high schoolers. Um, it's so they can really investigate the perspectives of climate change in a socio and political concept. And what's really unique to these resources, these videos, these activities, and this information and toolkits is that it really puts the idea of rolling out this curriculum as a solution to global problems like the pandemic and global situations that we're gonna be starting to conceptualize and starting to face as a population, not just as our regional populations and localized populations, which does go down to that scale as well, but then to broaden it out and think of how can we move and adapt as a global community. Again, this one ties in, this is a book. Um, it's mostly a book of case studies, which is really fantastic. It's a great way to kind of chew on and examine how the stakeholders in each area dealt with their problems, dealt with their solutions specific to their area. Um, one thing that when we're talking about climate education and climate resiliency is that we need to make sure that the solutions and the problems are identified by the stakeholders and by the people in the area. Um, that we allow them to offer the solutions first. So how that looks as uh, an educator is to let the students think, identify the problems, identify the runoff, maybe what they see in their homes or when they get to school and offer their solutions before we offer ours um, or before we suggest deeper work and to make sure that that really builds equity uh, and builds their sense of place. And it really creates solutions that are more specific to the needs of those people right there, which means that there'll be lasting solutions to climate change and climate effects that they're gonna be facing, such as flooding and drought and food availability. This book specifically has six chapters talking about um, a radical vision for education, what I just touched upon, that concept of equality in education and putting the power in the hands of the stakeholders and to that accountability in education um, and understanding really what our roles are and, and moving forward with teachers as the agents of climate action, that if the students aren't exposed to these questions that we act to give them a space in which to ask themselves the questions. So we're not asking them directly, we're not offering them answers, but that we're giving them the platform to start questioning the systems that they see around them. This one specifically works on a global scale, even though it covers very localized Northeast Pennsylvania, some Delaware based, um, case studies. It is supported by the UN Sustainability Development Goals, the Universal Education for Sustainable Development, and the Global Citizenship Education. I believe we have one more. This one is one of my favorites. I got a little, went down the rabbit hole a little bit on this resource, and I really hope you do too. Um, so what you can access from the Wakelet, I encourage you to click both the title that's on the top left hand of that box on the wakelet, as well as the link that you find within the descriptors. 
Um, it really leads upon, again, talking about compounding risk factors to local communities that not only do will we face climate change and climate impacts, but then compounding risk factors such as inadequate wastewater treatment or lack of access to safe and affordable drinking water, not just that short-term problem of water rising or increased temperatures. Uh, again, this circles back to the climate and community resilience building uh, and leadership development by putting the tools in the hands of diverse populations. Um, and the last bit I'd like to touch upon here, you can see on the logos here specifically, uh, as you get in there, and it's a very deep website, there are some great videos included. Um, As you can see on the logos, there's a great flow chart available. So for every subject of water resilience, toolkits, activities, the one that's focused on the community resilience and climate resilience specifically is the one I added an arrow to right here. And they really made, even though they have so many resources, they really made it clear for educators or anyone accessing it to really navigate and find their way to the information specific to what they're looking for. So I encourage you all to put time into looking into this. Um, these resources are really great. They apply to local uh, stakeholders. They apply to educators. A lot of them have links and toolkits and activities that students can access themselves, especially some of the downloadable materials um, are even set up to be accessed by young early elementary students and to offer a good basis for comprehensive learning of climate change and climate resilience. I'm not sure about you, but I'm relieved, happy, thrilled that we can use these words and bring them into our modern language as we kind of look forward to the future and navigate what we do know is ahead and what we don't know is ahead of us. Thanks so much, Elena. Yeah, that's so true. Um, and thanks everybody for sticking on. And there's so many resources that we just love to share. There's not enough time. So I'm just, if you can stay on for just a few more seconds, we've got a few more slides to share. We were going to do an activity, but just ran out of time. <laughs> but please check out our upcoming events with White Clay if you want to engage with this beautiful watershed that we spoke about tonight. Um, there's a White Clay Creek Festival that happens every year, and it actually will be outdoors and in person this year, um, Saturday, May 7th. You can check out their website, which will be popping up the information um, probably in the next few weeks. And we, Stroud, have a couple of canoe trips, um, one actually in White Clay Creek on May 14th, a Saturday, and that's free. And we also have another one if you're, it's kind of nearby in the Octorero um, Reservoir. Um, and so that one's also free and you'll get, you can get Act 48 from those, but please check out our events page if you would like. Um, and upcoming here at Stroud Center, we're celebrating World Water Day, March 24th, a couple of days later than the official International Day and um, unveiling our new watershed education mobile lab. So if any of you are educators nearby that would like for us to come to visit to do programs with or for you um, and your students, please reach out to me. Um, we can come with the mobile lab and also you can come visit us if you want for an education program, but details are on our website about that event as well. Um, so I'm gonna have to skip that. <laughs> um, if you can, please go back to that wakelet. There's a follow-up survey. I hope the link works. If someone can check that out, that'd be great. Um, we'll send a follow-up email with this recording. I'll also put the recording in the wakelet when it comes in the next few days. And please complete the post survey if you can, if you'd like to receive the Act 48 and um, or a certificate of participation. And we'd love to just hear what you thought about tonight. Again, this was meant to kind of um, set the scene about some of the current conditions and potential threats and um, also inspire you also for action and some actionable items and resources that can help you along the way. So thanks so much to 
everyone and thank you to all of you and all of our presenters tonight. Um, and if anyone has any, any last minute comments wants to stay on, tell me any kind of golden nugget that you took away from the evening or that you, any actionable items you think you might explore, any resources you thought were really tops and that you wanted to share. And we'll end with that. But thank you again for spending your Tuesday night with us. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, Elena, for sharing that. Great. Great, everyone listening, tuning in. Yeah, yeah. All right, well, be wild, be free. Have a great night, everyone. We'll see you in the next round. <laughs> Good night.